Wait a minute. Have you heard the strange tales of the whistler? I'm the whistler. It was awful. I, I dreamed there was a man in this room and he stood right over me. And he said I was going to die. That I was going to be murdered within 48 hours. Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things. For I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so I tell you tonight the strange story Death Comes at Midnight. John Prentice is a manufacturer, a very busy man who needs his rest. But John had a frightful dream. The dream was not brought on by a guilty conscience, but John's life has been above reproach. He loves his wife, Clara, and their grown daughter, Eva. He has done no wrong to any man. Why, then, this awful dream with its prophecy of death? Now, the following evening, the Prentices are planning to attend a lecture, and Dwight Cooper, Eva's fiancé, is going with them. The wife and daughter are in the living room awaiting his arrival. Well, there's Dwight now, Mother. I'll go to the door. Now, wait a minute, Eva. You'd better make sure who it is before you open the door. Oh, Mother, are you still worrying about that dream Daddy had last night? Well, I can't help being nervous about it. Well, of course it's Dwight. We're expecting him, aren't we? I'm going to let him in. Well, enter, my lord. Hello, darling. How come you're answering the door yourself? Maid's night out? <laughs> we haven't got a maid. She went to work in a war plant. Well, good for her. We're going to do without a maid for the duration. That's the spirit. Good evening, Miss Prentice. Good evening, Dwight. Now, you see, Mother, it wasn't a big bad wolf after all. Not this time. But we'd better be careful, Eva. Well, what's this about a big bad wolf? Mm, seems that Mother believes in dreams, Dwight. And last night, Dad had one that was really a uh, honey. Oh, I don't believe in dreams. Oh, Daddy! Yes? Dwight's here, so hurry up. I'll be there in just a minute. <laughs> Talk about a woman taking her time dressing. Well, what about this dream? You tell him, Mother. Well, I don't believe that all dreams have a meaning. Uh, but uh, this one John had was a prophecy, and I'm concerned about it. Yes? He kept hearing a man's voice telling him over and over that he was going to be murdered within 48 hours. Murdered? Can you imagine such a thing? Oh, well, I wouldn't be alarmed, Mrs. Prentice. According to psychologists, a dream has no possible relation to the future. They say a dream comes from experiences of the past that have been registered in the subconscious mind. Well, if John's been murdered in the past, I haven't heard about it. Oh, now, wait. I didn't mean it quite as literally as all that. The mother's been counting the hours, Dwight. Let's see, the dream came at midnight last night. That means Dad's hour of doom is midnight tomorrow. If he isn't murdered sooner. Well, maybe we'd better not risk taking him to the lecture. Oh, huh? I wish you two wouldn't joke about it. I, I don't think it's any joking matter. Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Hello? Mr. Prentice there? He's busy right now. Could I take a message? Yeah. Tell him he better come to the phone, whether he's busy or not, if he wants to save his life. What? This is a matter of life and death. Oh. Well, hold the line a minute. Of all the amazing things, there's a man on the phone who sounds like a gangster. He wants to talk to Daddy about saving Daddy's life. His life? Maybe I'd better talk to him. Oh, no, no. Uh, no, get John on the phone. Call him, Eva. Oh, uh, Daddy, you want it on the phone. It's important. All right, I'm coming. Oh, don't tell me that dream didn't mean anything. Now, Mother, don't get excited. Well, just what did this fellow say? Well, he... Oh, here's Daddy. Yeah, hello, Dwight. Good evening, Miss Prentice. Uh, Daddy, wait. I don't know who that man is, but he's terribly hard-boiled, and 
He said I'd better get you to the phone if you want to save your life. What's this? Oh, John, I... I'll, I'll, I'll see what it's all about. Hello? Mr. Prentice? Yes? You don't know me, but you better pay attention to what I'm telling you, see? A certain man here in town, a wealthy guy... He's offered me a nice piece of dough to put you out of the way. What? But I want to be reasonable, see? So I'll consider... Hey, are you listening? Yes, yes, I, I, I'm listening. Go ahead. Well, if you want to hike the ante a little bit, say to three grand, I'll call off my deal with this guy. What's more, I'll give you his name. I see. Now, three grand's a small matter to you, so... Wait a minute. Suppose you come here to the house and we'll talk it over. And do I sound like a chump? You're coming to see me, and you're bringing the dough. Oh, no, I'm not. You think I'm going to walk into a trap? You mean you're turning down my proposition? I certainly am. All right, mister. You asked for it. You'll be a goner by midnight tomorrow. All right. So listen. Hello. 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 <laughs> Midnight tomorrow. Now, not only in a dream, but in actual fact, John has been told that he will not live beyond that hour. John phones the police, and a few minutes later, Captain Arnold arrives at the house. Mr. Prentice, can you think of anyone who'd like to have you put out of the way for any reason at all? I... No. No, Captain, I really can't. Now, you've been in business a good many years. Uh, how about your business rivals? Well, of course, I've, I've made a certain amount of enemies, of course, yeah. but I... Don't think any of them would go so far as to hire somebody to kill me. Uh, you never can tell. Suppose you name some of your enemies. Oh, no. I... I'm afraid, Captain, I couldn't do that. Well, see here, why not? Well, frankly, because I, I might be causing an innocent person a lot of embarrassment. Oh, well, what of it? We've got to get to the bottom of this some way. Uh, have you had a quarrel with anyone recently? Oh, I know, I uh, haven't. Think carefully now. Well... Yes, yes, come to think of it, I did have a rather heated argument with a man the other day in my office. Oh, but I'm well, sure... Well, then, who was he? I'd rather not say. Was he a wealthy man? Yes. Then tell me his name. Oh, no, Captain, I'd rather not. <laughs> if you'd go to his house and question him, I don't want... How can the police help you if you won't help yourself? Well, this is none of my business, Mr. Prentice, but if I were you... No, I... no, Dwight, there's no use arguing. Got my own ideas on the subject. Well, that's that, I guess. We'll have to conduct our investigation without your help, Mr. Prentice. Oh, by the way, Captain, I'd, I'd feel a lot safer if you'd send an officer out to watch the house tonight. Well, I brought a man with me. He's out in the car. I'll leave him here. Oh, that'll be fine. I'll leave the car, too, in case he needs it. Well, we'll do what we can, Mr. Prentice. Let us know the developments. Oh, of course, and I want to thank you, Captain. Good night. Good night. Good night, Captain. So John is unwilling to give the name of the man with whom he quarreled. <laughs> is it really because he's concerned about the possible embarrassment of an innocent person? Tonight the house will be well guarded, and as an added protection, Dwight has agreed to stay in the Prentice's home. John, feeling quite safe, has gone to bed and fallen into a sound sleep. Then, at exactly midnight... Oh, oh, let me go. Let me go. I don't want to die. John. No, no, don't throw me off the bridge, no. Wake up, John. Oh, no, no, no. Wake no. up, wake up, John. Uh, what? Oh. Oh, John, you're in your room. Nothing's happening to you. Oh. You've been shouting your head off. Mother... Mother, what is it? Well, your father's had another nightmare. I thought that was it. Yes, even. It was terrible. What kind of a dream was it? Like the other one? Oh, it was worse. Now I know how I'm going to die and when. Oh, you're not going to die. I'm afraid, Eva. What did you dream, John? He... He took me in a car to the old river bridge on Tower Street. Who took you? I don't know. I never saw him before. He tied my hands behind me with a rope and... 
When we got to the bridge, he dragged me out of the car and oh. threw me into the river. Oh, my heavens. Now, mother, mother. Just, just as we came to the bridge, I saw an illuminated clock. The hands were pointing to 12. That's when I'm going to die. Oh, Daddy. What time is it now? Well, it's after 12. Oh, then it's tomorrow at midnight, just like that man said. Daddy, don't talk like that. This dream doesn't mean anything. What about my other dream? It meant something. No, it didn't. That phone call didn't have a thing to do with your dream. It was just a coincidence. Now, things will look different to you in the morning. Eva. Yes? Would you mind sending Dwight in here? But he's asleep, Daddy. I know, but please send him in. I, I want to talk to him. Well, all right. <laughs> Sit down, Dwight. They told me about the dream, Mr. Prentice, but I wouldn't let it bother me if I were you. I can't help being bothered. The dream was so vivid, Dwight, and it fits in so perfectly with what's happening in real life. Yes, I'll admit that's rather strange. The reason I sent for you, well, if anything should happen to me, I want you to sort of take charge of things for Clara and Eva. How do you mean? I've made a will that takes care of my property, but there's my life insurance. It amounts to $100,000, and the money will have to be invested. I see. Who's the insurance payable to? Clara, but of course she knows nothing about investments. You advise her, will you, Dwight? I've got faith in your judgment. Yes. I'll be glad to help in any way I can. I come to think of it, I, I owe a payment on that policy right now. But the grace period isn't up for a couple of days yet. I'll make the payment if I'm still alive. Oh, I have an idea you'll be alive, all right. But as you say, if anything should happen, I'll be glad to advise Mrs. Prentice. Oh, I knew you would, Dwight. And thanks. Next morning, John announces that he will stay at home all day. Clara, upset by the events of the night before, remains in her room. But John is feeling much better. He views things differently with the coming of a new day. He will not yield to this feeling of inevitable doom. He will fight the situation. <laughs> Hello? Mr. Prentice? Oh, it's you again. Dwight, get on that extension in the library. Just, uh, thought I'd call and ask if you've changed your mind. No, I have not. Much more, I defy you to even lay a hand on me. I'm being protected by the police. Well, ain't that fine. So you won't come across, huh? No, I won't. Look, Prentice, the water in that river is awful cold. What? What did you say? Hello? Hello? Dwight, did you hear that? Heard every word. Sounded like he meant business. Something wrong? That man, he phoned me again. I don't know what to think. Well, what did he say? He he wanted to know if I changed my mind, and when I told him I hadn't, he he told me the water in the river would be awfully cold. What? How did he know about my dream? How did he know? Yeah, it's the most uncanny thing I ever heard of. What's the answer to all this? Daddy, he didn't know about your dream. It's just the other way around. Well, what do you mean? I'm afraid Mother's right. Your dreams are foretelling the future, Daddy. They're warning you of what's going to happen. And now John's spirits are crushed again. For if the dream told the truth, then his fate is sealed in spite of anything he can do. Dwight, however, is not ready to give up. He is annoyed with Eva for admitting her belief in the dream. Darling, for your father's sake, you shouldn't have said what you did, even though you believe it yourself. Oh, I know, Dwight. Perhaps I shouldn't. I said it before I thought. But there must be something to those dreams. Yes, I know. You got me guessing. But look, let's try to do something. Do what? I've been thinking about this quarrel your father had. He won't tell us the man's name, but maybe we can find out. How? Through your father's secretary. The quarrel took place in his office, you know. Oh, yes. Miss Edwards might know about it. Well, shall we get down and see her? But look, let's not tell her what we want the information for. The less we say about this situation, the better. Well, we'll give her some other reason. Yes. Get your coat and head on, honey. We'll get out of my car. Miss Edwards, this is Mr. Cooper, my fiancé. How do you do? Miss Edwards. We'd like to ask you a few questions, if you can spare us a few moments. Why, yes, of course. My father isn't feeling very well today, and that's why he didn't come down. See, we've learned that he's rather upset about a heated argument he had recently with some wealthy man here at the office. Argument? Daddy won't talk about it. 
He hasn't even mentioned the man's name, but it's quite necessary that we find out all we can about it. If you'll tell us who the man was, we'll treat the matter in confidence. But, uh, I don't know of any fuss your father had, Miss Prentice. He, he's quite an even-tempered man. Yes? Are you sure you don't remember? Very well. There was an argument. I, I couldn't hear what was being said. They were in your father's private office, but I did hear your father talking quite angrily with Mr. Reeves. Who's he? Milton Reeves. He's been in several big deals with Mr. Prentice. Oh. Couldn't you hear anything that was being said? No. Just their loud voices. Uh, Mr. Reeves was angry, too, but I really couldn't make out what they said. No? Well, at any rate, we've got something to go on, either. Yes. I think we'd better have a talk with Mr. Reeves. Thank you, Miss Edwards. You won't tell Mr. Prentice that I said anything, will you? And, or Mr. Reeves, either? Oh, no. You can depend on that. <laughs> I'm Dwight Cooper, Mr. Reeves, and this is Miss Prentice. How do you do, Miss Prentice? John Prentice's daughter, aren't you? Yes, I am. Well, what is it, Mr. Cooper? I'm in a bit of a hurry. I, I'm going away on a trip this afternoon. I'll be very brief. We've heard that you and Mr. Prentice had some sort of a disagreement with each other a few days ago. Yes? Who told you that? Mr. Prentice is quite ill, Mr. Reeves, and we think it's a result of that quarrel. If we could find out something about it, we might be able to straighten him out. Well, John knows all about it. He won't talk about it, Mr. Reeves. He won't, eh? Well, John shouldn't let a thing like that get him down. Business is business, you know. He wanted me to renew a loan, and I refused to do it. So that was it. In his particular business, well, I I don't know what the future will be with all this rationing and priorities. Had you promised to renew the loan? Well, as a matter of fact, I had. But I changed my mind which is my privilege. John wanted me to wait a few days, said he was trying to borrow some money from the state mutual. But I didn't think it was good business to wait, so I called the loan. Oh, I see. I imagine that made him pretty angry. Did it? You'll pardon me, Miss Prentice, for talking so frankly about your father, but really, I never heard a man get so abusive in my life. Why, he actually threatened me. Yes. He acted like a schoolboy, said he'd get revenge. Do you think he will get revenge? Oh, no, no, I... Oh, Yes. You're afraid of him, aren't you? You'd like to arrange things so he couldn't possibly get revenge, wouldn't you, Mr. Reeves? Did you threaten him? Say, what are you getting at? I think you know what we're getting at. I do not. Now, see here. I've told you all I'm going to tell you, so now I'll ask you both to leave. Surely. You've told us quite enough, Mr. Reeves. Dwight, hadn't we better go to the police station and tell Captain Arnold? No, darling, not yet. But I'm sure Reeves is the one who's hired that thug to kill your father. So am I. He said he was going on a trip. He wants to be out of the way when it happens, so he won't be suspected. Of course. Then why shouldn't we have him arrested? I'd like to get more evidence first. I want to find out more about that loan. Who do you think could tell me? Well, Mr. McAdams ought to be able to tell you. He's the treasurer of Daddy's firm. All right, I'll go see him. Look, honey, suppose you take a taxi and go on home. See how things are getting along. Oh, Dwight, I... Please, honey, I may have to do some running around. Look, don't tell your father about this. Oh, no. All right, Dwight. But don't be gone too long. I won't tell him. But Dwight has been gone much too long to suit Eva. It is now 11.30 at night. Eva and her mother have become increasingly nervous as the clock ticks off the seconds, bringing the time closer and closer to midnight, John's last moment on earth. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Dwight, where have you been? We've been worried to death. Well, one thing led to another. McAdams had gone out in the country, but I finally caught up with him. Have you told the police about Mr. Reeves? No, I haven't. Where's Mr. Prentice? In the library. Oh, he's in a terrible state of mind, Dwight. He's got the door locked. He told the policeman to stand outside his window. Listen. Someone at the door. Oh, my heavens. Oh, why didn't that police... Now, don't stop. get panicky. I'll see who it is. Open the wicket. It's a messenger boy. It might be a trick. It looks all right. Telegram for Mr. Prentice. All right, I'll take it. Sign here. There you are. Oh, thanks, mister. I wonder who'd be... Mrs. Prentice, have I your permission to open this message? For certain reasons, I'd like to see who it's from. Why, yes, Dwight. 
Go ahead. What is it, Dwight? It's important. Very important. I've got to show it to your father right away. Mr. Prentice, open up. It's Dwight. Mr. Prentice. It's all right, Daddy. Unlock the door. Dwight's got a telegram for you. Hmm. Why doesn't he answer? Well, go outside and look through the window. The officer's out there. Come on. Where is that officer, Eva? I don't see him. I don't know, Dwight. Daddy told him to stay right here by the window. Eva, look. The window's wide open. What? What's that? Oh, my heaven. There's a policeman on the ground. Something's happened to him. He's hurt. Officer. Okay. Officer. He's coming around. What happened? Uh... I, I seen a car drive up in the alley. Oh. A light-colored sedan. And just as I, I started to investigate, somebody slugs me in the back of the head. That's, that's all I remember. And they've got him. They've got Daddy. Darling, I'm, I'm going after that sedan. How do you know where it went? I'll find it. I'll drive to the Tower Street Bridge. I'm going with you. No, you stay here, Eva. Why does Dwight think he'll find the light-colored sedan at the Tower Street Bridge? Is it because Mr. Prentice saw that bridge in his dream? Or is there another reason? A reason known only to Dwight. But Eva can't wait, and so a moment later, another car speeds toward the bridge. The policeman's car. The officer is at the wheel, and Eva and Clara are by his side. Oh, officer, can't you go faster? I'm driving as fast as I can, Miss Prentice. Say... I'd better put in a radio call to headquarters and have them send a squad car to the other side of that bridge. No telling what we'll run into there. There's the bridge right ahead, officer. And I there's see the clock. It. What clock? The one Daddy saw in his dream. And look, it's midnight. I don't know nothing about the dream, Miss Prentice. All I, I see know... a car out on the bridge. You see it? That's the baby. That's the one I saw at the house. Where's Dwight's car? Dwight's car isn't there. Oh, he must have got lost. Say, we'd better watch our step. The squad car ain't come to the other end yet. Oh, hurry, officer. Now, don't you get out of the car. You stay here. I'll see what's going on. Yes, but hurry. All right, Miss Prentice. You and your mother can come here. Daddy there. There ain't a soul here. The car's deserted. Oh, there'll be two ladies. He's already done it. Who's done what? Oh, can't you remember anything? I told you about Daddy's dream. I'm talking about that man. He's thrown Daddy in the water. Oh. Isn't there something we can do? Oh, it couldn't have happened very long ago. If your father's been thrown in the river, Miss Prentice, he's a goner, but oh, now no. nobody could swim in that oh, car. Oh, poor Daddy. What I can't figure out is why the guy left the car here. Oh, poor John. Hey, look. There's some rope in the back of the car. And a knife. He tied Daddy's hand. Hey, here comes the squad car now. They're coming in from the other end of the bridge. Oh, officer, who's this car registered to? Uh, wait a minute. Well, by golly, there's no registration slip in it. I know who it belongs to. Milton Reeves. I'll take the number and we'll check on it later. Well, what's up, Jack? Uh, it looks like there's some dirty work been going on here. Yeah? Maybe this guy knows something about it. Quit showing me, will you? Where'd you pick him up? He was running away from the bridge. Oh, he was, huh? All right, buddy. What do you know about this sedan? Not a thing. I wasn't on the bridge. Now, that's him. That's the man who threatened Daddy over the phone. I can tell by his voice. Well, now we're getting someplace. All right, you. Give. Where's Mr. Prentice? I don't know what you're talking about. You threw him into the river, didn't you? No. You're a liar. Come on. Talk! I don't know nothing. We'll get you to talk at headquarters. A few minutes later, the river's being dragged for Prentice's body. But what has become of Dwight? He hasn't been seen since he drove away toward the bridge. The two heartbroken women return home to wait for the sad news. They step into the house, and Mrs. Prentice breaks into a sob. Oh, Mother, you must try to get hold of yourself. We must try to be brave. Oh, I know, dear. I know. What has become of Dwight? Oh, I don't know what on earth could have happened to him. 
Eva, darling. Dwight, what are you doing there in the library? We thought you'd run out on us. Well, I haven't been here long. Oh, Dwight, it's terrible. I never dreamed such a thing was going to happen. No, no, just be patient, darling. <laughs> I'll tell you everything. I told you I finally saw McAdams. Yes? Well, the story about the loan was a lot worse than we thought. I found that Reeves had a grudge against your father. So he planned to ruin him and get everything he had. And he did just that. By refusing to renew and calling the loan. He did it deliberately. He worked in a backhanded manner and wrecked the business. He held the paper on everything your father owned. Father? Father's broke? Yes. Reeves broke your father. (laughs) Absolutely penniless. Reeves has the business, this house, everything. He pulled it so fast that your father hadn't a chance to get on his feet. When I found that out, I suspected the truth, but I wasn't sure until I got to that bridge. The truth? Then you did go to the bridge. I did. And I got there just in time to prevent the tragedy. I pulled, pulled your father into my car by force, and turned around on the bridge, and came back here. Uh, what do you say? <laughs> he isn't dead. No, he's here, in the library. Oh, oh Kevin. John, John. No, no, just, just a minute, oh, please. I'll bring him in. <laughs> Come in, Mr. Prentice. Oh, Father, thank heaven you're safe. John, what happened? I know how you feel, Mr. Prentice, but you better tell him. Yes, Dwight, I will. You see, my dears, I just couldn't bear the thought of my wife and daughter suffering poverty. The only thing I had left was that insurance policy, and it would have lapsed in another day. I had to think fast. John, you don't mean... If I'd commit suicide while the policy was in effect, you'd get $100,000. But I wanted to spare you the disgrace of a suicide, so I decided to kill myself and make it appear as though I'd been murdered. Then, as I developed the plan, I got an inspiration. Why not hang the murder on Reeves, the man who had deliberately ruined me? That would be my revenge. Well, now you know the whole story. Now you understand the nightmares. But the telephone call... I hired the man to make the calls and steal Reeves' car and drive me to the bridge and then jimmy the motor, as though it had stalled, all so that my murder could be... Traced directly to Reeves, who really had a motive to kill me. What motive? Well, my secretary knew all about it. When I discovered it was Reeves who was back of my failure, I threatened to divulge something I knew about him. He flew into a rage. The secretary heard him, and that was just what I wanted. But I knew I couldn't raise the money quickly enough, and my insurance policy was up tomorrow at noon. Well, that's the story. And it's all a miserable mess. <laughs> Yes, John. It's all a very, very sad situation. Oh, but wait a minute. What about that telegram the boy delivered earlier? Where does that fit in? Was that part of your plan, John? Telegram? What telegram? Let me see it, Dwight. Why, it's... It's from the State Mutual. They've granted the loan I requested. Yes, John, they've granted the loan. Now you can straighten things out. Now you can get back on your feet again. Think, John, what a sad tale this would have been if you'd followed through with your plan and Dwight hadn't caught you on the bridge at midnight. CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Tonight's Whistler story was written by Herbert Connor, directed by J. Donald Wilson, and came to you from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next Sunday, 9.15... I, The Whistler, will return to tell you another unusual tale. <laughs> Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.